Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We have um, two really interesting speakers, one virtually and one actually sitting beside us today, um, uh, with two interesting topics as part of the London Climate Action Week. My name is Phil Henry. I am the current chair of the Sipsi Brazilian City Group. Um, is hosting it, and to my right is um, Sandra Baer, who's our second speaker from Personal Cities, and also I am assisted by Sarish Wakim from uh, Atkins Realis, who are hosting us today. Thank you, and Sarish is the vice chair of Simpson Brazilian City. So thank you uh, for taking the time uh, on a lovely day. So it's going to be topical because it's quite warm out there, and the topics today are going to range <laughs> from heat and water. So quite topical. Our first speaker. And this is being recorded, so we'll be able to distribute this afterwards. Um, is uh, Claire Welfar. Um, so Claire is a Global Cities Lead uh, for Engineering and Management and Development Consultancy, Mont McDonald. Um, she's led regeneration, low carbon, and sustainable and innovation innovation projects across the globe. And Claire uses um, system thinking in terms of pushing boundaries and most importantly, how to improve people's lives. Uh, for over 35 years of experience in the sector, and she combines her practical understanding of construction, development and the drivers, along with policy engagement, and also brings the insight you need for technical and uh, political. So in a moment, Claire will be talking about uh, navigating extreme heat in cities, and a multi-layered approach. So if I can introduce Claire, uh, welfare from McDonald's and Claire, the uh, floor is yours, thank you. Okay, thank you, Phil. Um, and the other thing maybe to say is that I'm a fellow of SIBSI. Um, so, uh, and I, I mentioned that because thinking back to the 1990s and the sorts of projects we were designing, we were designing low energy systems, air conditioning systems. Um, and I remember a client, an enlightened client, asking me um, what sort of mitigation we should put into the system to allow for what was then uh, global warming. And um, we was thinking back to the answer then, which was put in additional space so that we could um, add additional cooling if we needed to. But we hadn't at the time really clocked the wider consequences of, um, of extreme heat. Um, and indeed, even um, pre-2022, uh, before um, the extreme heat events that happened in Europe, um, I think even then there was uh, only a small chance that we would get to greater than 40 degrees C as a temperature experience before about 2030. So it's come across, uh, it's come up pretty quickly. And I first came across the concept of extreme heat at COP26 in Glasgow um, in 2021, because the resilience hub there had started to use the term silent killer for extreme heat. And they had brought together um, a number of mayors from uh, from towns and cities where heat was already a problem. And I'll come on to some of the solutions that they already were throwing into the mix. Um, but I'll also, be, before getting there, I wanted to um, outline that, um, so we know now that um, extreme heat brings a short-term mortality issue. Um, so the summer of 2022 in Europe, caused something like 60,000 excess deaths due, due to severe heat. But there are also, we're beginning to understand the longer term issues. So we know now that it exacerbates me metabolic disease, things like heart, heart attacks and strokes. So if you've been exposed to extreme heat, those things are more likely in your future. Um, it's uh, increasing the likelihood of various infectious diseases, also increasing mental health issues as well. Um, I think uh, it affects things like sleep, but there are other consequences that um, through that um, the um, 2022 heat waves, there were more mental health um, approaches to the health um, sector as well. Then um, food production is affected. 
Um, for our industry, maybe um, something important to think about is the equipment failures um, and the cascade impacts of that. So what we're thinking about um, things like IT systems and air conditioning systems, so the NHS um, cancelled operations in, in 2022, roads melted, tracks buckled, people couldn't get to work. There's an economic consequence of this sort of thing. And then not only that, but essential services affected, not just healthcare, but firefighting, police, things like that. So having set the scene for um, the, the, the issues that we're beginning to face, I'll talk through some of the solutions. And as the title of my topic um, said, this is a multi-layer thing. So first looking at the governmental sorts of approaches, the, um, the COP22, um, Resilience Hub work, um, that's the first time I had heard of the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance with various mayors. So the mayor of Athens in Greece, Freetown in Sierra Leone and um, Miami-Dade County in Florida. Uh, what, what they were doing because they were already facing this sort of thing. So in Florida, the discussion was about introducing heat seasons like hurricane seasons and even naming some of the events um, which then sort of allows people to know it's coming and prepare for it. In Athens um, the mayor was talking about teaching in inhabitants the language of heat as a danger because in Greece um, people are fairly familiar with heat as an issue and they hadn't really the, the, the understanding of the danger of it was something that they were thinking about needing to do as our campaign. Then there were also discussions about the value of things like water fountains and evaporative cooling to reduce um, the air temperature. And in Freetown, so riffing off this green blue infrastructure, which is a really critical thing for issues for cities. Um, uh, in Freetown, the mayor had introduced uh, the campaign of Freetown the tree town and building lots more trees. So thinking about other cities so um, and the, the green infrastructure approach. So Medellin in Colombia, fantastic city for so many reasons. But one is the long term plan that they've put in place with green corridors along their roads and waterways and underpasses. And the consequence of that in beneficial terms uh, is things like air temperature um, dropping by um, around five degrees in um, extreme heat conditions, surface temperatures dropping by more than that, maybe 10 degrees, um, but also um, improving things like air quality and uh, reducing respiratory, respiratory morbidity as well. So um, having that sort of more indirect health benefit and something that is um, very built into how we should be thinking about extreme heat is the co-benefits issue. So that um, the green corridors also as a co-benefit uh, increased um, active travel. So 35% more walking and cycling, um, which is a which is an important point about when people are investing in some of these approaches, the fact that there are lots of different, that there's a sort of um, virtuous cycle of benefits that are important when you're talking about the investment agenda. Um, there are lots of emerging, um, lots of emerging understanding about the benefits of trees around and in cities, um, and generally a sort of uh, potential to reduce temperatures by between uh, two and five degrees C um, through some cities, including Madrid, is beginning that journey um, uh, of a. Um, something like a 75 kilometer long forest green belt around the capital is having those benefits. A really important thing um, is to think about preparedness. So um, uh, not just the, the long term understanding and planning that um, cities like Medellin has done, which is the sort of adaptive pathways approach, do some interventions now, know that you're going to need to put some in place later and not um, close off the avenues to in it that would enable those to happen. But the, the short term, so London this week, I believe, is doing um, a simulation exercise on extreme heat to understand um, 
who the responsibilities and the sort of priority of chain of command that might happen if things begin to um, break down. And then another thing, which is, as I was saying, things like um, the the transport um, transport being affected. What are the levels of ac acceptable service in an extreme heat situation? And um, how can how can the companies responsible, the operators, understand what those are in advance and plan for them, um, rather than uh, trying to keep up the level of service that would be relevant for uh, an everyday use? And one more thing on the the sort of city um, and uh, governmental uh, approach is cool spaces networks that cities like London, Paris, Toronto, and other cities are doing. Um, and this is an inequality response because um, people with air conditioned offices and air conditioned home are, are fine. But um, the cool space networks are thinking about the public spaces, it, both internal, so museums, um, hospitals, et cetera, and also uh, access to external cool spaces like pocket parks and making sure that people know where they are. And I really like an example that I read about recently in, Ven uh, in Vienna, which is um, called the Cool Strassen. So that's where um, they're uh, creating what they've called, called fog showers. So um, moist droplets in streets so that people can walk through a cool mist and cool down. Then coming to a, uh, a more sort of neighbourhood, I'm going to think about some neighbourhood responses and then come to building specific responses um, in neighbourhoods understanding in planning and all sorts of other things that we need to begin to change our vernacular if we are going to experience the sorts of heats that are more common in southern Europe. Um, and if you remember, if you um, have been on holiday to southern Europe or other hot countries, more use of shutters, um, smaller windows on sunlight exposed facades, um, blinds, balconies, things like that. So we may get to see buildings that look different um, and maybe not the extreme expanses of, um, of glazed curtain walling that are prevalent um, these days. Uh, adjusting comfort expectations in that sort of adaptive approach and understanding that um, the people may be a may be happier to uh, experience slightly higher temperatures if it's um, it's come, come over time rather than um, happened as a sort of naught to 60 approach. Then street layouts and massing and use of prevailing winds um, to, to be able to use passive cooling. And um, I remember reading a report maybe 10 years ago that showed that um, cities with random street layouts were much more effective at dissipating heat than those on a more grid approach because um, the reflectance between the buildings and the ability to, to dissipate was more effective. Um, and then in Frankfurt, again, something I read recently, um, they, in their planning system, they have put in place um, ventilation corridors. So much like um, the, the visible, mm, um, the buildings around St Paul's, you need to be able to have that um, line of sight to St Paul's. There's an equivalent one in Frankfurt to make sure that ventilation corridors are protected and the buildings don't occlude that. And then more on the building scale, making sure that in our designs, we're thinking about sustainable cool cooling approaches. So not just going straight for more air conditioning, but using those passive approaches. So the albedo effect, white roofs, um, using the transpiration benefits of green roofs um, and storage as well, the ability to uh, to use um, the, the the thermal mass of buildings. We know about that in the um, the heating season, but it's also effective in the cooling season. And we worked on a project in Abu Dhabi where um, in about six public sector buildings. Um, and again, this was quite a while ago, maybe 10 years ago, um, turning off the air conditioning and seeing how long um, the, um, it took for the occupants to notice that there was no air conditioning in the height of the day. And it turned out um, because of the um, storage effects of the building it was something like four hours before the internal temperature increased by um, around one degree C and the occupants noticed. 
So there's a lot of benefit in um, using uh, thermal storage approaches. And then um, thinking specifically about how we might have to amend our design of HVAC systems, um, uh, a couple of things that we were talking about in the office. Um, one is that um, for existing buildings with um, air conditioning systems uh, that hadn't haven't been sized for these extreme temperatures, the the need potentially to keep the keep the air conditioning on during the night as well as the day and making use of that the um, the storage effect uh, to be able to sort of give a sort of a boost to the air conditioning at the beginning of the day. And it, an interesting one about design of new systems or modification of uh, existing systems, so as not to waste the energy in the exhaust um, of the air conditioning system that in an extreme uh, heat situation will be lower than external air temperature. Um, so if we're exhausting at say um, 35 degrees, then that is beneficial and we don't want to waste it. So maybe in those instances, allowing for the exhaust air to come down to um, street level, so therefore it can have a beneficial effect on the on the public realm just outside the building. And um, I just wanted to finish on um, the the thinking about um, this as a um, as part of a system, and we've done some work in thinking about how the the um, the city and the services that a city provides um, and how cascade failure can affect at the highest level the, the services and the outcomes that city services are intended to, um, to achieve in order that you can understand the biggest levers that um, of, of benefits that can you can invest in. And generally, um, green infrastructure is a no-brainer in that um, in that effect, but there are other things that are important to understand in terms of um, least regret outcomes, because we know that the public sector itself is not be going to be able to, um, to instigate and uh, um, uh, invest in everything that's needed to protect um, our cities, and therefore they need to crowd in private investment and therefore being able to understand where the most beneficial activities are is a really important thing. I began to unravel a bit at the end, but I think I'll stop there. Um, Thanks, Claire. I think there's been a couple of questions, but I'll just say to um, a number of people at the moment, if you have any questions, um, I'm serious to put a note, please do put your questions in the chat that we can uh, um, poise to Claire. I think there is a, a Couple of questions. We've had a uh, post through in the chat. Um, Chris Jones says stress on constrained power distribution is also significant. The UK paid £9,000 per megawatt hour in 2022, narrowly avoiding a South East London blackout. And those can bring extreme social unrest. What do you have to say to that, Claire? <laughs> Um, I think that comes to my final point about what are the consequences of cascade failure and being able to present those as a, a sort of these these are different futures that we as a city could be facing and the businesses and the citizens in the city. Um, and that's and being able to show those as different um, different things that could play out is a way of helping those with money in the city. And that is, um, uh, I suppose, the um, the businesses that exist in the city, helping them see that it's in their interests to act in order for uh, that not to happen. So this isn't something that um, the public sector and the city uh, municipalities can solve on their own, something where we all have a part to play. So I think that's a good example of maybe showing uh, businesses that it's um, in their interest to invest in their own uh, reduction in um, their burden or um, that sort of power distribution uh, risk. Brilliant. Um, we've had another question through. Any thoughts on airspace double skin roofs, a bit like British trucks for the tropics had in the 1950s before widespread AC? 
That is a really good question. And I have to confess, I um, don't have um, that much detailed thoughts and knowledge. But I am just wondering whether there's anyone, uh, anyone else who, um, so on the call itself, who might have some thoughts on that and create a bit of a, um, a chat going, a side chat going, because um, I'm afraid I can't answer that one. Okay, we'll Thank hold you. on that question. We just had one more question coming through from Ritika. Um, if we're talking about heat seasons, what tools or technologies do we have to predict those happening or what needs to be developed? I love that question um, because the early warning systems in um, climate risk are really important. And I think they're more developed in the flood sector than they are in the heat sector. Um, but being able to um, combine the knowledge of what might be coming in terms of weather data with the other um, aspects that uh, that are integrated with that that would um, cause or alleviate um, the consequences of extreme heat are really important. And that's where the concept of digital twins comes in so that you have the data um, and you can play tunes on that. So, so it's the data analytics angle and the ability to, to do scenario planning of what might happen depending on this predictive future and then help the decision makers understand the decisions that they need to make with enough time that they can properly test and make those decisions rather than having to act instantaneously. So there's a lot of pre preventative decisions that can be made if you can see something coming, even if you don't have 100% accuracy, um, you can you can put things in place that are in that sort of preparedness space. So that's a great question. Thank you. But on, on the question about the ruse, I, I, I don't know if I misinterpreted Chris's uh, question, but it's more possibly around insulating the building from the effects of solar radiation. And certainly the work that um, our business and other consortia have, have done with green uh, infrastructure and therm thermal mass absorbing solar radiation, the impact is colossal in terms of the fabric of the building being cooler in summer, significantly cooler in summer uh, by around about 15 degrees at the, at the height, if it's 70 degrees outside and insulating. But that's not just a green infrastructure, it has to build up on the roof with um, soil. So I think what Chris was probably saying is when you can't put a load on a roof because of the structure, mm. insulate perhaps in some way to protect the, the fabric, maybe another way, obviously painting it white or doing some other intervention. But certainly if we can if we can use more green infrastructure, it, it, it does help in terms of that cooling over a wider space and protecting the, the, uh, the building. I have a question. May I ask that question? Yeah. So Claire, you, mm. you, I loved your presentation and it, it had lots of things to do. The one that I'm interested in is the albedo effect and you know, making roofs white instead of black and try to reflect the sun rather than embrace the sun. Um, I think most people don't know what that's about. I mean, everyone on this call may be well aware of it, but I, I think there's a, a way for um, uh, architectural firms, firms in the business of sustainability to talk more about that. Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, do, do you think people even know what the hell, uh, sorry, what that is? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess um, that uh, maybe not using the word albedo, um, but just that general understanding that um, white surfaces uh, are more reflective and absorb heat le less. And, and even sort of trying it out on a beach with um, white or black stones and knowing that um, if you stand with both right. feet on the white stones, it will it will be better. But you've um, you've prompted me to remember uh that um there's the, the, uh in somewhere like india i think that they, they made it into a business and created jobs so um women um had i think there's a business where they go and paint the roofs of of buildings and mm. so these sorts of things there are business models that mean that you can get them into the sort of common psyche perhaps through a sort of um a less obvious but more um, emotive backdoor, which could be the jobs one rather than the, um, yes. the needing to paint the roofs white one. 
Aye. We have any, any other questions? We have one final question. Yeah. Um, is there any consideration for the impact of heat on the livability of outdoor spaces, particularly in the warmer months? And this could become more of an issue over the next decades. Yes, um, there is bound to be. Um, what I'm thinking off the top of my head is um, again back to how um, how societies who are more used to uh, living in extreme heat how they um, how they use their outdoor spaces and thinking on a holiday I took maybe um, 30 years ago in Spain where there was so much out use of outdoor space as a as a place to um, uh, to meet people rather than be inside and just generally that um, and this was sort of using outdoor spaces in the evening um, rather than staying inside so just a different thinking about uh, about when you need to be outside and when you need to be inside that probably doesn't directly answer the question but um, that's what popped into my head mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. I think we're okay with questions. If you are any other questions during the course of the uh, uh, next presentation, please put them into the chat. Claire, are you able to stay on the, the call? Uh, I'm yeah. sure you might get questions for Sandra, of course, later on. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. And, and thanks again for thanks for your time. Much appreciated. Anyway, good to see you again. Thank you. And how many people are on the call? Um, I believe we have 30 or so. Oh, excellent. So thanks. So in terms of heat, um, moving on seamlessly to uh, water. Uh, so um, in person. Uh, um, so Sandra last year, Sandra Bell last year presented uh, online, but this year is actually in person uh, in in uh, in London. So I'd just like to introduce uh, Sandra Bell. So uh, she's CEO of Personal Cities. Uh, and she does collaborate with um, global communities uh, to, to, to develop strategies and sh strengthen city branding, but also look at social inclusion, climate action uh, and technology uh, community. Uh, you're also a brand ambassador for Smart Cities World, uh, and they have an event obviously this week as well, I yes. believe. Um, and as a platform to foster uh, innovative ideas to address urban challenges. Um, so lots of experience about Europe, Middle East, uh, Philippines and Taiwan. Um, I will just now hand over, I think we're okay with the IT, we're ready to go. Yeah. Um, so from uh, heat to water and Sandra. <laughs> Thank, away, you, Thank you Phil. Thank you Sarish. So fun to be here. I was expecting however some in-person audience so uh, one of the things I normally do would be to have a show of hands and uh, and in fact if some of you want to show your your face instead of your initials I would so love that but I understand you might not want to or be able to they can't okay. oh I hate that all right well forget that idea anyway <laughs> one of the things that I would do normally in a presentation is ask for a show of hands what do you think of the number if you're if you know anything about cities what do you think of the number 284 anybody have a thought about that can you just type it into the chat or yell it out or they can't talk to me again no no okay well i i will save save that uh, kind of uh, response oh Cities experience the warning scarcity. Oh my gosh, who is that perfect woman? The, the actual number, it was it Rika? Ritika. 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 Uh, that, that is the, um, the number of cities that are exposed to water scarcity by 2050, up from 193 in 2016. So you can see this whole idea of what's at stake in global water is about water scarcity. It's about so many other things related to water. I'm just going to talk about a few of them uh, this afternoon. But uh, that number, 284 cities will be exposed to water scarcity, including the 10, 20 mega cities. I mean, I hope you all are like, like mad already listening to what I have to have to say, because I feel like there's a huge um ignorance about that and we're going to talk a little bit about more that a, a little bit more about that in with specific cities but i wanted you to just think about that number that's it's a lot of cities in the world so 
the other things that, that are at stake, uh, for example, are access to clean drinking water. Um, one in four people on the earth today experience um, a shortage for drinking water. And that means drinking water, that means water for sanitation, that means water for agriculture, that means uh, water for economic development. So um, one in four, I mean, I hope you all uh, are from all over the world, I take it. Do we know? We don't know where you're from either. Anyway, <laughs> um, but it, I hope you um, realize that in some of the developed world, you know, we don't think much about clean drinking water, but trust me, it is a huge problem. And I think something for us to think about for us uh, in the developed world and for other people that are thinking about how to fix the problem. Um, the other, the other thing that's really at stake is not so much the disasters, but the the result of the disasters. Um, one in three people experienced a weather disaster in 2023. And again, I would ask for a show of hands. How many of you have been around a hurricane, a tornado, a cyclone, a, a flood? Uh, you know, fill in the blank. And some of this is what what Claire was talking about. It's related to heat and it's related to water. And, you know, the combination is really deadly. So we'll talk a little bit about some cities that are dealing with some of these extreme weather events that uh, I think are not um, flukes. They are coming back. I read that London is thought to be a risk, a risk of clean water. Yes, that's exactly right, Chris. And we'll talk a little bit. Well, I didn't actually put London on my list, but certainly uh, you know, this fair city in which I'm sitting today is has several problems with water that you, you know, you think, oh, you've got it under control, but I'm not sure they do. Um, and then the, the last thing on my list, um, what's really at stake in the global right water crisis is about sea level rise, uh, the flooding and the subsidence. I'm sure most of you know subsidence means sinking. And so cities are sinking. And we'll talk a little bit about that, the reasons for it, and if it can be prevented. So I just wanted to share with you some of the, the big problems uh, regarding water. There are many more, and there are many cities that I'm not even going to mention today that are um, in jeopardy of being in real trouble. So let's go to the next slide. I just want to talk to you about some cities, and I, I'm from the United States, but I travel all over the world, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some cities in the U.S. that are particularly vulnerable. This is an actually beautiful uh, photograph of El Paso, Texas. If you've not been, you don't necessarily have that sense when you, when you drive into the city, but they are having an incredible heat wave. Uh, I think more than 10 days of um, over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's 43 degrees Celsius. Does that sound right? Yeah. Uh, I only speak in Fahrenheit. But anyway, no matter what, we're talking really hot. And it's not so much uh, the heat, which Claire touched on, but how it impacts the use of water. Uh, if cities are really hot, then people want more water because they're hot. And then, you know, there's a greater demand for it. Um, El Paso... Um, has invested over $700 million, which is a big number for a city of El Paso size, just in wastewater treatment plants. Uh, so they're, they're experiencing incredible cost to fix some water problems that, they, um, that they've never had to deal with before. So I just, I just wanted to point out you know, a few things about each city that just should make you aware that the heat in El Paso, that's West Texas, for those of you that don't know the geography in the U.S., um, I think it's overwhelming. And, you know, it's right next to Phoenix, Arizona. That that mayor also has a lot of problems with um, figuring out what to do with this extreme heat and how it affects the supply of water in those cities. Um, you know, it, it, it's really also, of course, uh, something I'll mention later about how it affects vulnerable populations more than others. And we should all be apprised of that and, and working to change that. Uh, next slide. I'll go through these pretty quickly. This is Mexico City, uh, a glorious city, but um, one half of their water comes from the aquifer under Mexico City. Uh, and it's, you know, centuries old. And the trouble is that they have been over exploiting that aquifer so that the water underneath the city of Mexico is being drained and the land on which it sits is sort of of a clay consistency. The city is literally sinking. I think last year was 20 inches 
I mean, and so buildings are cracking, beautiful monuments are, are uh, crumbling. Uh, it's a big problem. And so the water, so what do they do about the aquifer? Um, you know, I, th I think what they're looking at is that there's um, ways to stop using all the aquifer, to, to install pump, pumping systems or to figure out ways to get people to use less water, which is a whole cultural mindset issue. But uh, Mexico City is looking at it because <clears throat> their population is, is so vulnerable in terms of not having drinkable water. Um, I think, and that, well, let's go to Amsterdam, I think. Um, so Amsterdam is a famous city. Most of you know it for uh, uh, being a city that knows how to keep the water out. And now Amsterdam, sadly, is experiencing tremendous uh, drought. And they now need to figure out ways to keep the water in or to bring in the water be, you know, to fight this drought. Um, the, the Amsterdam has two particular problems that, are, um, that make sense up in that part of the world. Uh, first of all, they don't have additional room to build reservoirs. Some cities are building huge reservoirs, which I'll talk about in a minute, but Amsterdam doesn't have additional space. The other thing is that if you've been there, Amsterdam is flat. And uh, the flatness is a problem because they can't use gravity to uh, move the water. Um, and, 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 you know, if you don't have gravity to, build, to pump the water, then you have to use other sources of energy to pump the water. So, I mean, it, it causes all other kinds of problems for Amsterdam. Um, but they are, um, I think, figuring out systems to to figure out to not to build more reservoirs, but to figure out how to create uh, gravitational systems to pump water so that they can have more. And they also have drained water from uh, the land, which they can now put back in. So it, it's hopeful there. I think. Go ahead. Um, this is Venice, Italy. I was just in Venice yesterday. Um, it is, of course, a remarkable city in so many ways and centuries old in terms of um, the canals. Uh, and many of you may have, be familiar uh, with what I hope is um, at least a temporary fix to their situation. They're, they've built an incredible system of floodgates called Mose, named after Moses, who separated the waters. So. <laughs> Excuse me, it's very clever, I think. And if you if you look at some maps of Mose um, from the air, you can see this huge span of floodgates. They're yellow. They're painted yellow. And interestingly, uh, the Venetians are so proud of the beauty of their city that they didn't want uh, these floodgates to be observed unless they need them. So this huge span of yellow floodgates is underwater until the storm comes and then it raises up like some kind of a monster <laughs> to keep the water out of um, out of Venice. And again, um, I'm hopeful that it's not a Band-Aid. Um, I don't think it is long term. Um, and because of sea level rise, you know, Venice is particularly vulnerable. Um, but they they have paid. They've spent money, millions, millions, millions of dollars to build Mose. And, you know, I think they're a great example of a city that's doing things uh, to take action. And, you know, whether it's enough, uh, you know, we, we will be determining that in the future. Uh, next uh, next city. Um, oh, Doha. So uh, isn't this a great picture of Doha? And it's like these crazy quantities of buildings and the desert right nearby. But um, uh, Doha, um, Interesting, they um, are building these mega reservoirs. In fact, I was telling Phil earlier today that they're now in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest reservoir of drinkable water in the world. It's some 436 million gallons of water. And the purpose of these reservoirs is to give the city drinkable water. In other words, if they run out of water because of the desert, the heat, the the uh, you know the conditions of people using too much water. They now have a reservoir that would last uh, the inhabitants of uh, Doha for 14 days. So, uh, and I think their population is something like tripling uh, very soon. So they've got a lot more people, uh, still desert conditions, 
and uh, still a need for, you know, storing water. And Saudi Arabia told me years back that desalination, yes, they're all doing desalination, by the way, and I think that's um, uh, good news, bad news. Uh, they're certainly uh, figuring out the, a way to use the salt, you know, the salt water and transfer it into um, desalinated water. But I think it's also not a, um, you know, it's just one thing they need to do. Oh, I'll answer that question later about Neon. Um, let's see, what else did I want? Oh, the really interesting thing about Doha, give me a break, is that they um, have used a lot of water as a population, as a culture, because guess what? They don't pay for it. Isn't that shocking? <laughs> I mean, if you live in most of the populated parts of our world, you pay for water, you pay for electricity, you pay for uh Water, electricity, gas. Gas, thank you. <laughs> you pay for these things. So I think, again, Doha has a particular challenge to get people to understand the value of water. And um, later this week at the City's Climate Action Summit, I'm going to be inter interviewing a woman named Paula DePerna who's written a book called Pricing the Priceless. Guess what the priceless is? Nature. So if we can figure out ways to put value on that, uh, we're definitely going to be in a better place down the road. And I think the Qataris are uh, struggling with that culture of not having to pay for water. Oh, it's just a free resource. No, it should not be and is not a free resource. Uh, I remember when we used to say water is the new gold. But anyway, we've moved on from that. Okay, next slide. I'm moving quickly. Oh, good. This is my last city that I'll talk about. New York City. I, um, I live in Washington, D.C., but I'm in New York City a lot. And it is... Um, a spectacularly vulnerable city for sea level rise. Um, I think the the opportunity in New York is to build seawalls, to build, um, you know, to to get people to change their attitudes about uh, water usage, conservation, water efficiency, leaking pipes. I mean, the city is has so you know so many uh, jobs to tackle, but the the exciting thing that New York City is doing today, which I think they started in 2022, someone on the call can correct me, uh, is called the Big U. So the Big U is the letter U, um, and it goes from East 57th Street around the around this, what you're looking at on the map or on the picture, is uh, the Big U is going all the way around up to 42nd Street on the, on the west side. Um, uh, and it's a seawall. It's a seawall that will protect the lower half of Manhattan, which is where the financial district is, interestingly. And it's where, you know, so many people live. So they're trying to protect the city. Uh, I think they're, um, they're struggling with not, not so much to spend the money on it, but to actually, you know, make it happen. I mean, you want these beaches to still exist. You want... Uh, the skyline of New York to still be beautiful and protected. Uh, but kudos to New York City and several of the past mayors for, you know, having the foresight to build this big U and, and make it happen. Um, yeah, so I, I could talk about another 20 cities, but we don't have any more time. So I won't talk about any more cities. I'll go to the next slide, which is for, uh, for me the most important uh, message for you uh, I, I think there must be architects on the phone, there are engineers, there are designers, there are building people, um, lots of people on the, on the call today that have expertise, but I'm really putting it on you personally, rather than your business or your community or your city. Uh, I am, I'm angry that people are living with it. You know that phrase, oh, I'm just going to live with it. I'm just going to accept it. I'm just going to go on. And I think that's a big problem, certainly not just for water and not just for heat, but for all of these climate challenges that we have, people need to step up. So these are my four ideas about what you need to do. And I want you to take this back to your family. I want you to take it to your boss. I want you to take it to your, your coworkers, whoever you can talk to about this. So, so the first thing is to show how climate is transforming your community and do it visually. In other words, show them a map of the big U. Show them what Mose did in Venice. Show them how uh, Doha is building this huge, huge, huge reservoir. And show them that that is 
visually different than it used to be. I feel like there's not enough communication about the consequences of our inaction. And I don't know, I, for me, pictures, videos are worth much more than these words. Um, and I, I think it's up to you in your community, in your company, to take this action, to show how things have changed. You know, do you have less of a beach? If anybody's been to Malibu, California, you'll see the erosion of that beach. These are very expensive houses without a beach. So I, I think, you know, if you can show that, then people, I think, are inspired to, to take new action. Uh, the second thing is to gain community support to mobilize action. Make sure that government leaders, private enterprise, understand the problems. And I think there's also a, a lot of talking about it, around it. Stop doing that. Stop get, uh, try to get more specific, try to get more engaged and have conversations about it. It, it. Some of this is very controversial and of course expensive. So I think it's up to you to sort of say, what am I doing in my community? And your community can be the globe, I don't care, but I, I really encourage you to, to mobilize that action. The third thing is to work collaboratively. Um, we talk about collaboration all the time around smart cities. And there's no question that, uh, you know, you can't do it alone. You have to engage all the players. But defining these solutions, you just have to understand that all these fixes will require uh, a receptivity. You have to keep an open mind about what, what new things could be done. You have to have political will, which we have been missing, uh, I think, around the globe. Uh, you have to change your mindset. And I think that's another thing that... Um, each of you, if you talk about it to people. Uh, I was at a party last week in Venice and the, uh, in Vicenza, and none of the people knew anything about the water problems in Venice. I mean, that's a global fact of life. And they, they weren't clear. They didn't know about Mose. They didn't know what was going on to protect uh, this very precious city. So, you know, what's wrong with that? We've got we've to get people to... Um, change their mindset and to talk about it. And of course, you have to work collaborative, collaboratively to define solutions because it takes a lot of money. I was at COP28 this past uh, uh, year and um, in Dubai, and it was the first time where the money people came to Dubai and said, uh, private equity firms, banks, investment banks, they all were very conscious of the fact that this is not gonna be done by government alone. Government doesn't have enough money. It has to be through private enterprise and other sources of funds uh, to, to make changes that are going to matter. And finally, this is my final point, but um, I think it's important to keep a sense of urgency about it, uh, uh, sort of a can-do spirit. It, it's so easy to be pessimistic about this. It's so easy to be doom and gloom. And I urge you not to do that. Um, the idea is to be hopeful. Now, that's different than being optimistic, because optimism as Václav Havel, the former president of the Czech Republic said, uh, hope is different than optimism. Optimism is sort of this idea that, that you'll, get the right, uh, you'll get the right outcome. Hope is not that. Hope is just that you know to do the right thing. I hope that this works. And uh, I encourage everybody on the call to write me to, oh, go to the next slide, please. <laughs> you can write me, call me, LinkedIn on me, LinkedIn with me. Uh, I'd love to hear your ideas about this, and I'd love to hear your feedback about what we've, what Claire and I have talked about today, because I think uh, there's just uh, not enough action. As Elvis Presley once said, a little more conversation, a little less conversation, a little more action. <laughs> so thank you so much for the opportunity to do thank this. You. This is really fun. Well, we've been, been around the world and as we have so I don't think there's been too many presentations <laughs> like that. But Sandra, so thank you. That. There was a question that came through um, Suresh earlier that um, was skipped around uh, Neon or Neon. Oh, yes. What was the question about Neon? Um, uh, I don't know who put the question in, so apologies. And, oh, what are your thoughts on the various Neon pro projects pipelined across the Middle East? Well, that, that would be a two hour answer. But instead, um, uh, the Saudis are doing amazing things technologically. It's shocking to me, breathtaking. And it does help that they do seem to have quite a bit of money. Uh, so I think that's all good. Um, I guess the, you know, the social aspects, the, the recognition 
of the human elements of um, how you use water and heat and climate uh, is to be determined. Uh, I, I'm, I guess they've broken ground. I, I'm not sure how much progress they've made. Claire, you might be aware of that. But I think, I think in theory, NEOM is spectacular. I'm a big supporter. Uh, in, in practice, I, I am hopeful that they are very conscious of the social elements of what they're doing, the community around this pipeline of cities and pipeline of technology. And uh, Claire, you want to add to that? I um yeah on the hopeful side um yes. I definitely echo your thoughts that the Middle East with the can do attitude and the money and the desire to go further be more bold than anyone has been before they could drive the industry so in my mind what I've been thinking is about things like um uh, decarbonized concrete decarbonized steel where the industry has been trying to create solutions I suspect that ne projects like Neon will just push it further and faster because of the money and their buying power. So that's my hopeful response. That's right. That's right. Well, if they if they think about community, I worked in Saudi Arabia on King Abdullah Economic City, which is uh, the other side of uh, Saudi uh, near Jeddah. And I think that they didn't think enough about how to build a city that is sustainable, that is safe, that is you know, a place where you're proud to live. And uh, I think maybe they're changing that a bit in the, um, I'm hopeful. I wrote a paper for the Saudis about trust. So I hope that right. they know how to trust each other and build something that's really uh, long-term. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you in person. And Claire, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your crowd. I don't think there's any more questions. Uh, we've had a few questions. Right, okay. Well, in that case, uh, before I go on to the questions, I was, I'll was let Sarish do the questions in closing. So I'll just say to everyone on the call, thank you for the time. Uh, the, the, this will be recorded, so it will be available. If you've liked any of the discussions today at the Sipsi Brazilian City, please uh, look for other events and come along, either in person or online. Love to have you involved. I'll hand over to Sarish now with the closing remarks and the questions, and uh, thanks. thank you again. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start off with a few questions. Um, I think this is a question that we've received in the chat. Um, and I think this can go to both yourself, Sandra, and to you, Claire. Um, what role can insurance play in protecting vulnerable people, for example, outdoor workers or infrastructure from extreme heat? Do you say the role of insurance? Yes. I, yeah, I think um, there are some creative approaches to insurance, um, which requires a, a, a sort of pairing it back to first principles type of thing. So um, I'm thinking, so I'm in a conversation on the decarbonisation side, which is about um, bringing together cities with the investment sector, including the insurers, because they're long term patient capital. So they they've got longer term uh, sort of uh, payback expectations. I. I I'm trying to get my um, brain cogs going on the extreme heat one, though, because I can't quite think of the answer. Well, I can I can add to that, Claire, because I um, I think extreme heat is another uh, weather disaster. So we mm -hmm. have hurricanes, we have tornadoes, we have uh, earthquakes, we have extreme heat, and insurers are increasingly in trouble, in my opinion, because they have trouble insuring for these terrible disasters. And I think cities, communities that are smart, are figuring out how to reforest the city to build an urban forest. They're figuring out how to make their city, um, you know, to have places where vulnerable populations can go in extreme heat. Or if they also lack water and they have no water to drink, they have to go somewhere. So I think there's an opportunity for insurance to say, if your city does X, we will provide insurance for it. And yeah. uh, it, it's tough because uh, I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, I was in uh, Florida. Um, and the 
uh, a city in Florida near Naples that was really decimated in Hurricane Ian. And immediately after the storms, uh, uh, development companies started building high rises. But guess what? They were not insured because there was actually there are actually lots of data and projections that there will be another hurricane, same city, same time next year. And so the insurance companies said, well, we're just not going to insure them. And, and then guess what? People still bought them. You know, wealthy individuals say, well, I can't be insured. I still want to live there, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I think the whole industry is at a tipping point now. I did. I, I did. Um, I think one uh, example of discussing insurance in relation to heat, which is um, I think some insurers are moving out of insuring vin vineyards in places like France. However, what they're doing rather than just removing and looking the other way, they are creating funds, innovation funds to help the vineyard owners find their own solutions with innovation money such that the insurers can come back in once those solutions are in place, which I thought was an interesting um, responsible approach to to this the innovation is a real um we're talking to the association of british insurers at the moment so it's not just insurance industry that's in problem it's the reinsurance industry that insures yeah. the insurance industry mm -hmm. people like munich who are in trouble as well because of these floods mm -hmm. and issues so having innovation the problem is that Ensuring innovation is a risk or has been a risk, but keep doing what we've done is a higher risk, of course, because we know it's going to fail given the uh, the issues. So having innovation is the way forward, but the engagement with insurance company with the financial companies, investments are the way forward to say we need some trust here looking at innovation or funds to see the benefits and then obviously to ensure that both both areas, insurance and reinsurance, are really in trouble. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, we've had another question through, and gosh, this is a long one. So I'll try and summarise it, James. Um, although public engagement is a prerequisite when seeking equitably to help address communities disadvantaged in access to water and protection against extreme heat, would you also recommend highlighting who and what is causing the problems? Um, Typically, these are um, by consumption, by the global and local rich, um, and more directly, particular companies. Um, in London, local authorities tend to focus on advising impoverished communities in vulnerable localities how best to respond when affected. Um, in effect, conveying that those who suffer are the only stakeholders who can or should respond. What do you say to that <laughs> statement? I'm not sure I follow that whole question. Um, saying, are you think, saying that I, certain or, or organizations are responsible for creating the heat problems? I think I think the question is, um, although you know public engagement is quite important in helping address communities that are disadvantaged, is it worth highlighting what is causing these inequalities um, and who is causing these inequalities and calling them out? Yes. The, um, the, the sort of um, behaviour change uh, sort of approach, I think, is generally about um, tapping into personal motivations, which is generally that's more successful if you tap into the positives rather than the negatives. So find the, the bit of the conversation that um, really chimes with people. And again, on the decarbonisation side, that could be about health and air quality as opposed to the, the net zero conversation that doesn't really mean anything to people. So so I, my response is the sort of find the positive angles and um, go large on those and sort of maybe play down the negative side of things. Well, I would push back a bit on that, Claire, because I think we should definitely try to be positive, but I think there's not enough calling out of the bad actors. And frankly, I, I'm tired of it. I mean, let's talk about why these disadvantaged communities are particularly vulnerable, not only to heat and to water, but all kinds of sustainability problems. And I think they're, you know, we're, I don't know, people are fearful to call them out. And I, I think we should do more of it. But some of it is best done through journalism. Some some of it is best done, you know, within a company, within a corporate boardroom to get people to to talk about what the problem really is and why it's so bad. 
I I like so um, you just made me think about the power of culture um, and the media, and I'm thinking of two particular things. So there's Blue Planet and um, the turtle with the plastic straw that had a massive sort of change in uh, what people cared about. And the other is um, the TV program Alan Bates versus the Post Office, where you know that. They're trying to hold people to account conversation of being going on for what nearly a decade. The media created that sudden pull to make something change. So the power of power of culture, I think, is also a really important um, uh, strand that we can make more use of here, both in the positive and the negative um, views that we both articulated. Mm -hmm. okay. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, oh, I like this question. To what extent are we relying on engineering solutions to help resolve the water challenges, for example, using sea walls or man-made reservoirs, versus using nature-based solutions, um, such as you know, restoring natural ecosystems? That is a really good question. In fact, there's an article in the Washington Post that I read in preparation for this meeting, and the question was, can we engineer our way out of water problems? Uh, I think the, the article was pretty much focused on, um, on the United States, but the, the question, I think, I, I mean, it's sort of like, th this is the thing to ask, can, what can we do to get out of these problems? And if it's engineering or architecture or design, or if it's community engagement, you know, whatever it is. But the, um, you know, I think some things that are happening in the world have to do with, um, you know, stopping, the sun's radiation, like they're, they're designing these huge parasols above the earth to stop, you know, bad radiation coming into the US, I mean, coming into the world. Uh, so I think the, the, the answer from my perspective is it depends. But the other answer is, you know, give it a shot. I, you know, if you're an engineer, the engineers that I work with that I completely respect are very uh, creative. Uh, you know, sometimes those two words don't go to de together, but they should and they do. And I think we need to to do more to look at in, you know, new tech uh, innovation that, you know, maybe using old tech, but new ways of innovating it. I I'd say go for it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything to add to that, Claire? I think um, on that depends. I, I guess I think it's both because in my mind, um, the the natural solutions are by far the best. And, you know, indigenous communities and their knowledge of how to be resilient um, so that uh, it's not it's not um, fail safe. It's safe to fail these days and things like mangroves to um, to. Um, mitigate the risk of um, things like storm surge and things like that. However, we are we have reached the uh, margins of the carrying capacity of our planet. Therefore, that's why I think sometimes we're going to have to um, innovate our way out because there are too many of us and the lifestyles on our planet are having too many consequences to 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 be able um, to to have the nature based solutions as the only solution. However, I think the astute engineers are the ones that look for the nature solution first before um, going for the innovation. I, th I just have to add to that, Claire, what you just said. It's completely true. And I was just in um, Miami, not just, I was in Miami last year, and, um, you know, they're figuring out new ways to build reefs. So that, you know, mm. instead of the, if the reef is uh, damaged because of, uh, warm ocean water and they can rebuild the reef so it's so it mimics nature so it has all the little holes and the interstices in the material they're using to rebuild the reef so the fish go back there and, and the coral go back and, and uh, inhabit it so it, i think these nature-based solutions are also definitely not talked enough about and, and not demonstrated i mean when i saw the the picture of the reef that they had in, and it wasn't even in there that long and then these little fishes were swimming in it as if it was a real reef so uh, i think these ideas are just they're everywhere so 
So follow on question to that then. So why do you think nature-based solutions aren't being implemented as much? We're seeing all these benefits that nature-based solutions can bring and we're really talking about them. But why are we not currently implementing them? Money. That's what I think, money. But I also think that um, if any of you um, feel like it, go to the Biomimicry Institute. It's based in California. They're always talking about how to mimic nature and don't, you know, don't discount how smart nature is in terms of saving the planet. And if we could go back to that sort of th rethinking it. But I do think um, uh, the, the reason we don't do more of it is because we don't talk enough about it. And, you know, are there any... Are there any nature-based solution experts on the call? I think maybe Claire, but I don't know. If some of you know this this way of thinking, it is just a new mindset. So yeah, let's do more of it. I think that's a great a great question. What do you think, Claire? Uh, so uh, we have some brilliant nature-based um, experts in the company, um, and I think maybe it's back to. So the industrial revolution and new shiny technology has it's somehow that's been our holy grail for so long. We've lost the art of understanding the capital that nature brings. And we've we've sort of we were looking the other way and we've lost it and we need to bring it back. And that takes time and effort. But there are so many powerful people with that agenda um, that, again, with my hope hat on. Um, I think we'll get there. Whether in time, I don't know. I just have one uh, favor to ask. Can you go back to the last slide in my presentation? Sure. I, I forgot to mention this. I can't believe I did it. But Cities Climate Action Summit is going to be held um, this Wednesday and Thursday. It's uh, an event uh, sponsored by the Smart Cities World. Uh, go that one, yeah. Um, where it's virtually on the 26th and you can still sign up for it. Uh, just go to smartcitiesworld.net and you can see how to sign up for it. I think the in-person event on uh, County Hall is um, fully booked, but uh, come and join us for the virtual one. And I think we'll be doing some uh, filming of the in-person session. So we'll share that afterwards, but, right. but come to this summit because just so you know, it is the only, um, it's the only event during London Climate Action Week focused solely on cities. So there's a lot of city leaders coming, a lot of people that are, uh, you know, working with cities to to help them through this crisis. So please join us. Thank you. Great. Great. And I think that brings this presentation web webinar to a close. Um, we have gone slightly over time, but I'd like to thank everyone for joining and taking part in this discussion and contributing to the conversation. Um, just on on a note as well, and um, if you'd like to hear more about the Sibsi Institute's group and what we're go getting up to in the, with the in terms of our events for the rest of the year, please follow our LinkedIn channel at Sibsi Resilient Cities Special Interest Group, um, as well as our Twitter feed, which is Sibsi underscore Cities. Um, we'll keep you updated and share, continue sh um, looking to share knowledge around um, encouraging resilience in cities. Um, we hope you have enjoyed this webinar and we hope to see you again soon.